Welcome to Signs of the Times, a look at recent world events from around our kitchen table. Welcome to another Signs of the Times podcast. On last week's episode, we were discussing the subject of cults with Laura Knight Yadchik, and uh, she was bringing up the work of Andrew Lobachevsky, uh, who is a PhD in psychology and whose book we will be publishing as soon as possible. And he wrote on psychopathy. In fact, his his work is a, a rather extraordinary look at, at psychopaths and the, the various types of psychopaths. Well, interestingly, he actually calls it the study of evil. Ponderology, I think, is the, is the actual definition of the study of evil. But then there's not much difference between evil and psychopathy in the world today. So this week we, we figured we would try and take a look at current world events and give some some practical examples, as it were, of the the topics that we discussed last week, including Lobachevsky's work. Well, for some practical examples of uh, of Dr. Lobachevsky's work on, on psychopathy uh, or ponderology, the study of evil, as he calls it, uh, we don't really need to look much uh, further than the, than the daily mainstream news and what's going on in the, in the world today. Obviously, the first thing that comes to mind is the war in Iraq, the, the phony uh, false war, if you want to call it, that was started by uh, the Bush administration. But as we've mentioned in previous podcasts, it is very unlikely that, uh, that, that the public uh, faces of the Bush administration are really the people who devised and planned and orchestrated and are continuing to orchestrate the, the war in Iraq at the minute. At least not to the extent that they would like us to believe. Yeah, because, of course, it's important for any government to uh, maintain the illusion of, of control and of being in control and of um, of, of um, fulfilling the wishes of the people, as it were. But um, as is the case in, the, in, in American politics, uh, which is also uh, very true for other Western, particularly Western governments, but also any kind of government uh, around the world, the fact is that the... The, the governments rarely, as, as I'm sure many of our readers are, sorry, listeners are, are aware that um, government these days does not, or rarely, if ever, uh, fulfills the wishes or the desires of the people. I mean, this is uh, obvious from the fact that the various uh, demonstrations and, and polls that were taken prior to the Iraq war, uh, showing that around the world, just about every uh, country's government that signed up to support the war in Iraq uh, the people of, of of those countries were up to eighty or ninety percent against the war in Iraq, but of course it's not, it's not a matter of um, of governments simply not doing the will of the people, but rather of governments manipulating and uh, presenting to the to the, the their their citizens that they are in fact doing the, the their will, or at the very least that there is uh, representation within uh, within government. Uh, for the will of the people, and for example, in in, in American politics, you have the, this idea of the of the left and the right, the Democrats and the Republicans, and uh, there was a an interesting article just this week where uh, comes from the the Washington Times, I think, um, and the title was "U.S. admits 50,000 troops to quit Iraq," uh, and this was a story about um, a Democratic senator, Senator Biden, who came up with a, uh, an Iraq withdrawal plan which turned out to be very close to uh, a withdrawal plan that, surprisingly, the Bush administration has now tabled, uh, where 50,000 troops would be um, uh, withdrawn from Iraq next year. And uh, in, the, in, the comments, in his comments uh, about his plan for, for this withdrawal, Senator Biden, he was advocating a withdrawal of the troops because the Iraq war was not going... In his, in his opinion, was not going according to plan or according to the plans of, of the Bush administration. And his comment was um, to the Bush administration was, are we going to have traded a dictator for chaos or are we going to have traded a dictator for a stable Iraq? That's the real question. And that depends on the president's actions from here out, said Senator Biden. Now, this, on first glance, might give the impression that... Um, that there is a, a, a representation uh, for all of the, the and, and we can probably safely say that, that there's a majority of U.S. citizens who are against the war in Iraq, given the, the extremely low standing in the polls that the Bush administration has at the minute. So this gives this idea that um, uh, 
that the people who are against the war have a representation because there's Senator Biden who is uh, advocating, uh, criticising the government and advocating the withdrawal of, of, of American troops from Iraq. But contrary to, um, to Senator Biden's comments that the outcome of this is going to be either uh, an Iraq in chaos or, an, or a stable Iraq, the facts uh, are, are already in on, on the war in Iraq and what has been traded, in effect, already, and there's no way to change this, is that the American government uh, has traded uh, the removal of a president of a foreign nation who posed no threat to anybody, least of all the American, uh, the American people. So he has traded, they have traded that for the deaths of 100,000, of at least 100,000 uh, Iraqi civilians, innocent Iraqi civilians. So that is the legacy of the war in Iraq, and it's got uh, nothing to do with uh, creating a stable Iraq or any any future uh, flowering of democracy and uh, freedom or liberty in Iraq. Uh, Iraq has been destroyed, and along with it, at least 100,000 Iraqi civilians' lives. And this gets us to, to what we want to talk about here uh, this week, which is what is it that motivates uh, a group of people to to do this, not only to actually kill and maim hundreds of thousands of innocent people, but to create this um, false idea that there's any kind of representation for anti-war in American politics. Uh, there is none, obviously, uh, because, as we've stated uh, the facts are already in. Uh, Iraq has been destroyed uh, in many different ways. And uh, just before we get to that, we also recently on the Science page had uh, an article with an accompanying image of a U.S. representative who was presenting some quote-unquote evidence that had been given to uh, U.S. politicians by the Bush administration to get them to support the invasion of Iraq. And in the the image was of this this representative with a uh, a poster board and it was a, a blow up of this document and everything on the document had been blacked out it was i mean the entire document had been censored and so this guy was basically saying well you know i mean look i mean this was the kind of evidence that the bush administration gave us so you know it's not our fault and of course our comment was you know gee it's it's a uh, rather interesting that, I mean, here the, the U.S. representatives were given basically no evidence at all, and now they're saying, oh, but, you know, it's not our fault, and yet they all support it. I mean, you know, based on literally no evidence at all, they just went along with whatever the Bush government said, because why? Why did they go along with it? Obviously, they were acting against the will of the American people. And for their own will. Yeah, exactly. And so that that gets us to the the crux of the matter, if you will. So in past podcasts, we've discussed the notion that the powers that be intend to reduce the population. And, it, I mean, this is this is basically no secret from people like Marie Strong and Mike Rupert to the Club of Rome and the Lambda Corporation. Uh, arguments have been circulating for, for years now. Usually they cite diminishing resources, uh, certainly oil, as some of the primary reasons that population reduction is or, or will be necessary in the near future. And interestingly enough, climate change is offered as another. And as we've covered previously, we we have the idea based on the available evidence that the powers that be intend to control and deceive the masses because when all this chaos hits, and, and we've seen the beginning of it with uh, volcanoes and, and huge earthquakes and the tsunami and a ridiculous hurricane season, Rita and Katrina striking the U.S. and melting glaciers at a glaciers. I mean, at a phenomenal rate. The idea of population reduction at the hands of a small group of people on the planet is obviously a, a terrible concept for a lot of people to actually to to take on board. Anybody could be forgiven for questioning as to whether there would be anybody who would uh, conceive of such an idea uh, in such a in such an unemotional, matter of fact kind of way. But the fact is that there are people on the planet, as uh, Dr. Lobachevsky has uh, has described from his years of, of study, who, who do think in this way. And as we mentioned on last week's podcast, basically the reason they can uh, come 
to these heinous conclusions and carry out these or, or plan things such as uh, such as population reduction and, uh, and and waging war on on the innocent of the world is because they simply don't have the normal as we would understand as human capacity for empathy or compassion or conscience and this this gets us back to the idea of um, one of the main questions a lot of people would have is or a lot of people seem to believe or think and they can be they can be understood for thinking this that the Bush administration has in some way made a mistake or the neocons or the planners of this of, of the war in Iraq and everything that's happened since since 9-11 that, that it's all, all gone kind of pear-shaped as it were and that these people are in serious trouble. Uh, I mean, we've had the the possibility of indictments against the Bush administration and, and the possibility that they would all be thrown out of government, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, if you factor in the idea that these people essentially don't have uh, a conscience, or um, one of the things that people uh, don't understand uh, is that these types of people who, who end up in power uh, for various reasons, um, they don't wage war to win war necessarily, they wage war simply to wage war, uh, because that is essentially what they are. That is who they are. They, um, as we've stated, they don't have this uh, normal human uh, emotion of compassion or empathy for for fellow human beings. So the any conscience or remorse that, that an ordinary person might have for over the idea of, of hundreds of thousands of people, innocent people being being killed, uh, just doesn't uh, figure in 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 the way they uh, well, it doesn't figure in their plans. So the fact that that the world is on a on a very slippery slope to to I don't know to Armageddon to hell uh, is really just a logical outplaying of the fact that there are people in power around the world who do not have any uh, anything to stop them uh, they, they don't have the mechanism within them that would lead them to uh, to 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 stop before they they push the entire planet over over the edge of the cliff yeah, and they they certainly wouldn't hesitate to engage in a bit of population reduction. And in uh, the adventure series uh, written by Laura Knight Yajic, uh, she did a little research uh, into a, a guy named Hugh Everett, who might be familiar uh, to some of our listeners. Um, he was the author of the Everett Wheeler Interpretation of Quantum Mechanics, and he also happened to work for Lambda Corporation. And in her research, she uh, research into Lambda Corporation, she came across uh, some papers, one of which was written by uh, a man by the name of Joseph George Caldwell. And he wrote uh, a paper entitled Optimal Attack and Defense for a Number of Targets in the Case of Imperfect Interceptors Related to uh, Nuclear Weapons and, and Campaigns Involving Nuclear Weapons. And one of the, the, the most interesting things that this man Caldwell had written uh, on his website was the idea that Earth has a, a maximum sustainable human population, and he proposes that this population is about 10 million people, uh, 5 million of which are basically the, uh, the the technological society. Basically, they, they live in, a, in, in heaven, and then there's the other 5 million people who are sort of the peons for those in charge, and uh, they would be a more primitive population, uh, or, or so he writes. And he, he came to this conclusion because he says that uh, instead, of, instead of approaching it from the, the maximum sustainable population, he, he actually came to this number by approaching it from, from the perspective of what's the minimum population that can be supported. And he says, well, because of you know, mankind's industrial activity produces so much waste and it can't be metabolized by nature, and you know, any attempt to maximize the size of the human population risks total destruction of the biosphere. So here we have the idea that, you know, I mean, this is a guy who works for, for Lambda Corporation, which is, of course, associated with uh, all, all kinds of interesting characters, and they've conducted all kinds of interesting experiments, and they have the idea that, well, you know, I mean, the ideal situation would be that there would be 10 million people on the Earth, and we'd have half the population being basically the rulers and the other half basically being the, the peons, so to speak. And, of course, we have the idea that the people who would be ruling would be, well, the psychopaths. Well, it all sounds very logical, you know. I mean, that you look at the, at the, at the state of the planet and you look at the, what the planet can, can um, reasonably provide for. And um, at least from these people's point of view, uh, 
it, it is very logical, but in this concept, in this idea of population reduction and a minimum amount of people on the planet, i.e. 10 million people, you have uh, the essence of, of the thinking of, of this type of person, of, of, of the psychopath, who is completely able to put the welfare, let's say, of, of inanimate objects or the welfare of the planet far above the welfare of human beings that they're that they're willing to you know we've got six billion people on the planet and they want to they want to get rid of 99 point something percent of those because they don't see anything wrong with that they're able to look at it in this way without any emotion without any uh, empathy for their fellow human beings and uh, they just envision themselves on a paradise like planet which of course they will then uh, go on to um to probably exploit and destroy in the same way that they have always done so we're going to take a short break. We'll be back in a minute to continue our discussion of real-world examples of psychopathy. A warm welcome to listeners all around the world on the World Wide Web. You're listening to Signs of the Times. Signs of the Times. Welcome back to this week's Signs of the Times podcast. We're talking about psychopathy. Keeping this idea of the maximum sustainable population of, of 10 million human beings on the planet, let's take a look at some of the recent stories related to Iraq. Uh, on the page recently, we had one article from the LA Times entitled A Journey That Ended in Anguish. And basically here the story was there is a Colonel Ted Westhusing, who was found dead at a military base near the Baghdad airport with a single gunshot wound to his head. And supposedly the story is that he committed suicide. Now, this was a guy with a, a doctorate in philosophy, and he had been sent to Iraq. Actually, he had volunteered to go, uh, and he was put in charge of training Iraqi security forces to take over security duties from U.S. troops. And, I mean, his record is impeccable, and supposedly he became sort of uh, disillusioned with the security contractors and the, uh, you know, I mean, basically they're there and they're they're killing and they're profiting from their killing, and uh, his family doesn't believe that he committed suicide. Uh, when he was found in his office, uh, there was a manager who went in and, and picked up the pistol that was at his feet and allegedly tossed it onto the bed, and the explanation given by this manager was that, well, with 30 years from military and law enforcement training, I didn't want the weapon to get bumped and go off, which is, of course, I mean, I mean, that's ridiculous. If weapons, you know, went, you know, went off by, by just being bumped all the time, well, that wouldn't exactly be safe, would it? So here we have a guy who, it seems, was uh, perturbed by what he discovered in Iraq, and all of a sudden he ends up dead. Then we have uh, another recent story about a 52-year-old grandfather who was ordered to army duty. Uh, he had been retired for 17 years, and he had remained on the ready reserve, and he's been ordered to report for duty uh, on December 4th. So, obviously, there are a number of uh, ordinary Americans. I mean, you know, we have the story of Cindy Sheehan, who, whose son was killed, and, uh, of course, you know, pretty much everyone knows who she is. Uh, and at the same time, you know, I mean, we have, you know, the children of, of mostly middle, middle and lower class Americans who are, who are going off to, to die for these wars. And I mean, you know, do, do Bush's or Cheney's children or the, the, the children of, of, uh, senators go off to or die the generals. for generals, well, you know, or generals will, you know, of course not because, and, and any time one of them does, it, it practically makes front page news because this is such a rare thing that it makes the headlines. So... At this point, we get into uh, Lobachevsky's work, uh, 
Uh, and in fact, Laura Knight Yajic has, has written a new article with uh, some excerpts from Lobachevsky's book, Political Ponerology, uh, which we have linked uh, off the science page. And it's entitled Political Ponerology, a Science on the Nature of Evil Adjusted for Political Purposes. And as we were discussing last week, according to Lobachevsky, there are people who are real full-blown psychopaths, and they have a, a certain effect on other people where, you know, some people are resistant and other people are not. And those people who are not so resistant to the the charms of the psychopath, if you will, will basically begin to act in a, a psychopathic fashion, even though they are not true psychopaths themselves. And one of the most interesting things he writes is uh, a, a comparison between a society that's ruled by normal people versus uh, what he calls a pathocracy, which is uh, more or less a society ruled by, by psychopaths. And he writes, what would happen if a state of affairs ensued which conferred internal peace, corresponding order, and relative prosperity within the nation? The overwhelming majority of the country's population, being normal, would make skillful use of all the emerging possibilities, taking advantage of their superior qualifications to fight for an ever-increasing scope of activities. Thanks to their higher numbers, there would be a higher birth rate of their kind, and their power would increase. This majority would be joined by some sons from the privileged class who did not inherit the psychopathic genes. The pathocracy's dominance would weaken steadily, finally leading to a situation wherein the society of normal people take back the power. To the pathocrats, this is a known and nightmarish vision. And he continues, Thus, the biological, psychological, moral, and economic destruction of this majority of normal people is a quote-unquote biological necessity to the pathocrats. Many means serve this end, starting with concentration camps, including warfare with an obstinate, well-armed foe who will devastate and debilitate the human power thrown at him, namely the very power jeopardizing Pathocrat's rule. Once safely dead, the soldiers will thereupon be decreed heroes to be revered, useful for raising a new generation faithful to the Pathocracy. And if you think about this, it appears that this is exactly what's happening in the U.S. You have these, uh, the, the neocons who are in positions of power and of course, they're not going to send their own off to, to battle. They're going to manipulate the masses, uh, you know, the average American, to go off and fight, primarily the, the middle and lower classes. And so, I mean, I mean, certainly you'll have uh, psychopathic types uh, in the military, and that's, that's basically uh, a given. But at the same time, we have this idea that the, you know, the war in Iraq, which is being perceived as this giant disaster... Well, maybe it's not a disaster, because if we consider what Lobachevsky is saying, what if what's actually happening here is all these people who are being sent off to war, you know, the intention is to, to basically get them killed. And then when they are killed, they are praised as heroes, which then fires up the population, including a majority of quote-unquote normal people, i.e. people who are not psychopaths or who have not been influenced by the psychopaths in power. And the result is that... All those people who are are not uh, inclined towards psychopathy are basically wiped out, and essentially the the population of of quote unquote normal people is reduced. But it's interesting because the uh, although a lot of the majority of people do not have direct contact with psychopaths, and they uh, so they're not influenced by them, but they can be influenced by them because, I mean, when you state that uh, soldiers are, are are whipped up into this uh, patriotic fury to, to go to war and die and then their families back home are, are told that they are heroes and they themselves then get whipped up with patriotism and stuff, this is a, a very direct uh, effect of or, uh, on them of, of the psychopathic thinking because the result is that you get people who are who are non psychopathically inclined who are actually supporting the activities of the psychopaths in terms of supporting more wars uh, and it's a vicious it's a vicious circle there in, in that in that it's, it's self perpetuating um and it also reminds us of um of the whole uh, Abu Ghraib scandal and the various other um, areas where um, torture uh, was was being carried out by by uh, U.S. troops or the U.S. military under the direction of certain individuals, it seems, who are, who are uh, unknown, we can say. Um, what seems to be the case from that is that, um, that there was an organised and institutionalised plan or, or campaign of, of torture, but 
I mean, the thing about torture is that it's been proven time and time again that torture generally doesn't work, yet we see that the Bush administration or uh, or members of the Bush administration um, actively promote it. Now, we have to ask ourselves the question, if it doesn't work, why are they doing it? Why do they promote it? And following the same idea that Scott has uh, presented, obviously one benefit would be to essentially psychopathize, if we can use that word, the people who are who are in this war environment, who have been manipulated to, go in, to, be, to be in this war environment, and then are encouraged uh, on top of that to, to commit acts of torture. So they are essentially these p- people who are potentially non-psychopathic, uh, who are made into semi-psychopaths, if, you want to, if, if we can say that. Um, so it's so it's interesting, and the other thing is that uh, the other question is why would uh, Rumsfeld and Cheney, who are who, who it's pretty clear did actually actively promote uh, the idea of um, torture in, in in Guantanamo Bay and in Abu Ghraib and in various other uh, um, prisons in Iraq and elsewhere around the world, why did they promote this? Given that there was probably a very good chance that that uh, this scandal would emerge and there would be a from, from our point of view and from, from an average normal person's point of view, there would be a negative fallout that uh, there would be, this would reflect very negatively on them, but that gets us back to the to the idea that these people don't care. They don't have the capacity to feel remorse, to feel guilt. Uh, to ha- they have no conscience. So from their point of view, there was, there was no reason not to because they were following, a, they had a, a plan, an idea to, as we say, psychopathize a, a large percentage of the of the American military and and then indirectly uh, uh, their families and the people back home so that was their plan and any negative fallout they had that figured they could they could manage it uh, and certainly they didn't uh, care or didn't have any feelings of remorse or guilt they couldn't be shamed in any way uh, by by the emergence or the uh, the exposure of this of the scandal so this is the kind of people that we're that we're dealing with here and there's it's a problem yeah so we have this idea that that perhaps the Iraq war which is going very badly, in quotes, perhaps it's not going very badly because perhaps the whole idea is to have uh, as many of these normal people being killed off as possible. And then, of course, you have all these other countries who are basically sitting back uh, and and they seem to be doing nothing. And Lobachevsky offers uh, another uh, interesting possible interpretation of of exactly why that is uh, when he writes that any war waged by a pathocratic nation has two fronts, the internal and the external. The internal front is more important for the leaders and the governing elite, and the internal threat is the deciding factor where unleashing war is concerned. In pondering whether to start a war against the pathocratic country, one must therefore give primary consideration to the fact that one can be used as an executioner of the common people whose increasing power represents incipient jeopardy for the pathocracy. After all, pathocrats give short shrift to blood and suffering of people they consider to be not quite conspecific. So, in other words, is it possible that there are leaders of other nations who are not standing up to the U.S. and who are not going to uh, engage them directly because they realize that the leaders of the U.S. are are in this uh, particular group of, of psychopathic types, and to confront the U.S. would simply mean that the U.S. would fire up the military, they'd bring back the draft, and they would take all these uh, these non-psychopathic types and throw them in the military to go off and, and be killed at war, which then means that basically the, the psychopaths win and, and everybody else loses. And in fact, when we look at the recent news again, there's the video of it seems to show security guards in Baghdad randomly shooting at uh, Iraqi civilians. Uh, they're, it's a video they're uh, from the back of uh, some kind of uh, car or SUV, and basically every time uh, another vehicle approaches at high speed, the people inside just start firing their machine guns and, and kill whoever's in the car. And, of course, we've run several articles, uh, actually numerous articles on the science page, about the the security contractors and the Bush administration's use of them in Iraq. Which just highlights the fact that this is a very difficult situation and uh, we're in a lot of trouble in terms of dealing or f- trying to find a way to deal with this or, or in, in, in ever um, putting any hope on there being some power anywhere in the world that would be able to, uh, to stand in opposition against uh, such people. It kind of 
brings to mind the the image of like a a, a wild animal or, or or a rabid dog maybe or something like that 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 you simply that, that you can't uh, appeal to it in in any way because it's, it's, it's essentially it's to a large extent insane um, and that uh, you can't you can't um, you can't interact with it in any kind of a reasonable way or rational way or appeal to it you have to as Scott said, uh, in terms of other other countries and other other leaders that we might expect would try to stand against uh, the U.S. and the U.K. and Italy and uh, the other nations that uh, supported the, the the Iraq war and and probably soon the, a greater war in the Middle East. They can't. They have to be very careful in how they in how they deal with it because, as Scott said, it's very likely that any kind of um, threat or subtle threat or any attempt to stand against them or to oppose them will simply exacerbate the problem and make them lash out with with redoubled fury. We're not so naive to assume that the only psychopathic leaders are in the U.S. because obviously, without doubt, if a given percentage of the population are, are psychopaths, well, then that means that most likely there there are psychopaths in other countries. So obviously this is this is something we have to take into account. But it does raise the interesting possibility that this reason that Lobachevsky gives may very well be a reason why some of the countries who are not under the control of psychopathic leaders are being so restrained in, in their responses. Uh, then again, you know, we, we also, as Joe mentioned, there's the U.S., there's the U.K., the, the USUC alliance, the U.S.-U.K., and uh, with Australia and Italy, and, and the leaders of these countries seem to be playing the game quite nicely and their leaders seem to exhibit certain psychopathic characteristics. Well, it's not even that they seem to. I mean, anybody who wants an example of, of what a psychopath looks like, acts like, talks like, um, well, maybe not looks like because that's a misnomer. Um, they're, they're not identifiable by any appearances, but by their actions and by their words and by the extreme and very obvious lack of empathy and compassion they have for the suffering of any other human being. Look at George Bush, look at Tony Blair, look at John Howard from Australia, look at uh, Berlusconi in Italy. Um, when they talk about uh, torture, when they talk about uh, the deaths of innocent civilians, they, they sure they try to present it in a way that, that makes it seem like they, they care, but their actions show something completely different. Their actions show that they don't care at all and they've done it so repeatedly and so so blatantly that the only conclusion is that they do, not only do they not care, but they don't have a capacity to care. This this is just kind of a, a practical example of, of the, the topic of cults and, and psychopathy and, and Lobachevsky's work. Um, of course, you have people like Cindy Sheehan, and you know there is an actual real anti-war movement, but the anti-war movement is not something that is... There are no political leaders who are basically in the anti-war movement. It's, it's all strictly the people standing up and saying, you know, we're not going to take this crap anymore. Um, I mean, other and then than being that, ignored. Yeah, and, and then being ignored by the politicians, even those who, who claim that they're, that they're struggling against, you know, the Bush regime. And, of course, as we can see from, you know, some of the articles that we've mentioned in, in this podcast, I mean, obviously, the only reason that these people are actually speaking up now and, and trying to distance themselves from the Bush administration is because they believe that it will benefit themselves. You know, they're, they're trying to save their own butts, basically. And so th- this is sort of a... A rather interesting example of the the concept of cults. I mean, in essence, what you have is a cult of psychopaths. As Laura mentioned last week, you have all these people who are worried about cults and, and suicides, and oh, you're gonna you know drink the Kool Aid, and, and yet here you have all these these thousands and thousands, uh, eight thousand by our last count, uh, American soldiers who who went off to Iraq and died in in the the disaster there. And yeah, I mean, talk about cults. Jonestown, uh, the most fam- one of the most famous cults, and Waco. Uh, each of them in Jonestown, nine hundred people died. Uh, in Waco, I think it was forty or fifty something people died. A, a relatively small uh, number of people. But in Iraq, we've got um, the real figures for Iraq for U.S. soldier deaths uh, is somewhere around eight thousand. You've got uh, at least one hundred thousand Iraqi civilians dead. So by anybody, by any stretch of the imagination. The Iraq War and what has happened since 9/11 is uh, what we're seeing there is um, is evidence of certainly one of the biggest in, in recent times cult massacres that the world has seen. So obviously, it behooves each one of us to research uh, psychopathy. We highly recommend Hervey Cleckley's book, The Mask of Sanity, which is available as a free download on our website. And of course, as we've mentioned before, uh, Andrew Lobachevsky's book will soon be available from Red Pill Press. And we'll announce that on the science page when it's released. We also have uh, a rather large section of 
our website devoted to the topic of, of psychopathy, uh, which you can find at the site map, which is linked off the top of the signs page. And I just wanted to make one point before we go that, as Scott said, it behooves all of us to uh, study this phenomenon and the psychopaths and, and the effect they have on, on the human race and the planet because um, the last thing any of us want to do, and this is something that all of us tend to do, all normal, average human beings tend to do, uh, which is to project onto people. Uh, particularly people in power, uh, project onto them uh, emotions and empathy and compassion that we have that they do not have. Because to do so will very likely um, involve serious implications, dire implications, I should say, for the human race and the fate of the planet as a whole. So that about wraps it up for this week. Uh, Thank you for joining us. And as always, you can find articles related to all that we've discussed today at signs-of-the-times.org and thank you for joining us we'll see you next week for chaos or are we going to have traded a dictator for a stable Iraq? That's the real question and that depends on the President's actions from here out, said Senator Biden. Now this on first glance might give the impression that um, that there is a, a, a representation uh, for all of the, the and, and we can probably safely say that, that there's a majority of US citizens who are against the war in Iraq given the, the extremely low standing in the polls that the Bush administration has at the minute. So this gives this idea that um, that the people who are against the war have a representation because there's Senator Biden who is uh, advocating, uh, criticising the government and advocating the withdrawal of, of, of American troops from Iraq. But contrary to, um, to Senator Biden's comments that the outcome of this is going to be either uh, an Iraq in chaos or, an, or a stable Iraq, the facts... Uh, are, are already in on, on the war in Iraq and what has been traded in effect already and there's no way to change this is that the American government uh, has traded uh, the removal of a president of a foreign nation who posed no threat to anybody. Try and take a look at current world events and give some, some practical examples, as it were, of the, the topics that we discussed last week, including Lobachevsky's work. Well, for some practical examples of uh, of Dr. Lobachevsky's work on on psychopathy uh, or panorology, the study of evil, as he calls it, uh, we don't really need to look much uh, further than the than the daily mainstream news and what's going on in the, in the world today. Obviously, the first thing that comes to mind is the war in Iraq, the the phony uh, false war, if you want to call it, that was started by uh, the Bush administration. But as we've mentioned in previous podcasts, it is very unlikely that uh, that that the public uh, faces of the Bush administration are really the people who devised and planned and orchestrated and are continuing to orchestrate the, the war in Iraq at the minute. At least not to the extent that they would like us to believe. Yeah, because, of course, it's important for any government to uh, maintain the illusion of, of control and of being in control and of um, of, of um, fulfilling the wishes of the people, as it were. But um, as is the case in, the, in, in American politics, uh, which is also uh, very true for other Western, particularly Western governments, but also any kind of government uh, around the world, the fact is that the... The, the governments rarely, as, as I'm sure many of our readers are, sorry, listeners are, are aware that um, government these days does not, or rarely, if ever, uh, fulfills the wishes or the desires of the people. I mean, this is uh, obvious from the fact that uh, the various uh, demonstrations and, and polls that were taken prior to the Iraq War, 
uh, showing that around the world, just about every uh, country's government that signed up to support the war in Iraq, uh, the people of, the, of, of those countries were up to 80 or 90 percent against the war in Iraq. But of course, it's not, it's not a matter of um, of governments simply not doing the will of the people, but rather of governments manipulating and uh, presenting to the to the, the their their citizens that they are in fact doing. Welcome to Signs of the Times, a look at recent world events from around our kitchen table. Welcome to another Signs of the Times podcast. On last week's episode, we were discussing the subject of cults with Laura Knight Yajic, and uh, she was bringing up the work of Andrew Lobachevsky, uh, who is a PhD in psychology and whose book we will be publishing uh, as soon as possible. And he wrote on psychopathy. In fact, his his work is a, a rather extraordinary look at, at psychopaths and the, the various types of psychopaths. Well, interestingly, he actually calls it the study of evil. Ponderology, I think, is the, is the actual definition of the study of evil. But then there's not much difference between evil and psychopathy in the world today. So this week we, we figured we would... The, the, there will, or at the very least, that there is a representation within uh, within government uh, for the will of the people. And for example, in, in in American politics, you have the, this idea of the of the left and the right, the Democrats and the Republicans. And uh, there was a an interesting article just this week where uh, comes from the the Washington Times, I think, um, and the title was "U.S. admits fifty thousand troops to quit Iraq." Uh, and this was a story about um, a Democratic senator, Senator Biden, who came up with a, uh, an Iraq withdrawal plan, which turned out to be very close to uh, a withdrawal plan that, surprisingly, the Bush administration has now tabled, uh, where 50,000 troops would be um, uh, withdrawn from Iraq next year. And uh, in the in the comments, in his comments uh, about his plan for for this withdrawal, Senator Biden. He was advocating a withdrawal of the troops because the Iraq war was not going, in his in his opinion, was not going according to plan or according to the plans of, of the Bush administration. And his comment was um, to the Bush administration was, are we going to have traded at a 